So Freud was a pretty interesting guy. He, he wasn't a scientist, he didn't do any scientific research, but he did have a lot of research that he did uh, with his clients. He, he, if you don't know about Sigmund Freud, he was a Viennese physician and he would have patients come to his uh, clinic and have them sit down and talk to them about their problems, and try to help relieve some stress and some anxiety from them. He was a pretty effective guy and he became very famous for his ideas and his practices which are still being used and talked about today. We call it psychoanalysis or psychodynamics. But the basic idea of Freud's, all of Freud's non-scientific research is that you have these early childhood experiences which shape you as a person and they sh they shape the development of the human in the form of the three parts of your psyche, which we call the id, the ego, and the superego. So if you've heard anything about Freud before, I'm sure you've heard about these things. So the id, this is the part Freud believed individuals are born with. It's the most primitive part of your personality. It's also an unconscious part of your personality. It, it motivates you, it supplies you with energy, and it operates on what Freud called the pleasure principle. So, in other words, this is the part of yourself that just wants and craves things. You know, when you're looking at those potato chips across the room, you might know you shouldn't eat them, and you're not even that hungry, but you just want it. And that's your id. That's your id pushing you towards that course of action. So it's very self-serving and irrational. If you want to see a human that is basically just pure id, Look at a newborn. You know, newborns, they don't care about restraining themselves. They don't care about what time of day it is. They don't even care how much food they've had to eat. If they want something, they're going to let you know. Even if it's two in the morning, they're going to let you know that they want something. So that's, that's what the id is all about. It's very instinctive. <clears throat> but as a child enters the world with just pure id, they start to interact with that world, and this drives the development of the second part of the psyche, the ego. Develops in infancy as the individual learns what is possible and what is not possible. So this is where the child learns how to more interact in a more meaningful way with other people and the environment to try to satisfy those cravings, you know, the, that demand from the id. So. Freud argued that the ego operates on what he calls the reality principle, where the individual will be able to restrain their behavior until it's more appropriate or practical. The ego is also the part of your psyche that you are the most conscious of. You are generally aware of what you're doing and why. <clears throat> and then the third and last part of the psyche to develop is the superego. And this comes, according to Freud, from interactions with, like, caregiver, with guardian figures. You know, people who will either punish you for bad behavior or reward you for good behavior. You should think of the superego as like an internal parent, you know, an internal judge or censor, somebody who's in your head constantly rewarding you and punishing you for the things you do. And as, as Freud said, it comes from interactions with your parents. So when you do things that are bad in childhood and you get punished for them, that will develop into what we now call the conscience. You know, you feel guilty for doing things as an adult if you were punished for them as a child. The other side to that is called the ego ideal or pride. So this is where you feel prideful about things you do as an adult that you were rewarded for doing as a child. So as you can see, Freud put a very, very strong emphasis on interactions with parents, specifically with a mother figure. Freud talked a lot about uh, relationships with the mother. But Freud had a lot more to say than just these three components and how they develop. In fact, he talked a lot about how they interact. I already 
briefly describe how they interact, but here's a good illustration. So you see the ego is constantly in you know the middle of this push and pull from the superego and the id. The ego is always trying to best satisfy the id's desires while also satisfying the superego's desire to be morally good, you know, to not have guilt, to feel pride. And that results in the behavior we exhibit as adults. Another commonly talked about aspect of Freud's theories are the different stages of development. I mentioned in a previous video that uh, developmental theorists often talk about development as occurring in these kind of distinct stages where important things happen at a particular time in life. And the first stage, according to Freud, is called the oral stage. He calls it the oral stage because he observes that children of this age range, between the ages of zero to one, they, they really do enjoy stimulating their mouths. That's their primary source of pleasure, it's from stimulating their mouth. And he speculated that children who seem to be overfed or frustrated will potentially be have like kind of a fixation on this stage and that can manifest as a personality disorder later in life. And he called them oral dependent and oral aggressive. So it can go in one of these two ways. So if a child is uh, oral dependent, if they develop this kind of oral dependent fixation, then as an adult, they'll be more gullible, passive, and seeking of attention. But if, on the other side, the child becomes more oral aggressive, as they grow into adulthood, they'll be more exploitative of others and more argumentative. So if somebody's always trying to manipulate you, you could say they have an oral aggressive personality. That, that's the whole idea behind this oral fixation. But you may have never heard of these terms before. There is a term, however, that I'm certain you've heard of before. It's the anal stage of development. So this is between the ages of one to three. Freud calls this the anal stage because he notices that children seem to get a lot of pleasure from learning to use the potty. Or, you know, uh, they get a lot of, you know, pain and suffering from failure to learn to use the potty. And learning how to use it or failing to do so can result in a fixation at this stage. <clears throat> so it's important that parents don't use too harsh or too lenient uh, toilet training. So the anal retentive personality, which is the one that I'm very sure you're familiar with, is when a person is stubborn, stingy, orderly, and compulsively clean. If you've ever said somebody is being very anal, that's what you mean. That's what most people mean. But there's another kind of anal personality. There's called the anal expulsive, as Freud put it. It sounds disgusting, and it is disgusting if you've ever met somebody with an anal expulsive personality. These people are disorderly, messy, destructive, and cruel. I've had an anal expulsive roommate before, and it was not a pleasant experience. You know, this is the kind of person where you take one step into their bedroom, and you're stepping on dirty underwear. And there's like moldy pizza under the bed. It's, it's, it, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. <clears throat> now, the third stage is what Freud calls the phallic stage, because this is, as he observed, when children start to become more sexually aware. You know, they start to recognize genders, and they show a lot of interest and curiosity in matters of sex and gender. So this is between the ages of three to six. And this is where I want to remind you, Freud was not a scientist. You know, these theories we're talking about, they're interesting, and they have been very influential. People are still talking about this stuff today, and, you know, main culture. But this stuff doesn't have scientific support, okay? So I'm not trying to say we have any evidence to support any of this. In fact, in many cases, we have the opposite. We have evidence that shows this stuff just doesn't seem to work. But that being said, I just want to get that out of the way, because... When it comes to the phallic stage, this is where certain transformation needs to occur, according to Freud. This is where boys will experience what he called the Oedipal conflict, and girls will experience the Electra conflict. The Oedipus conflict, the Oedipal conflict, this is where, as Freud argues, 
the boy recognizes he's the same gender as the father, but he also recognizes the father is a superior version of that gender and now feels a kind of conflict, like a rivalry for the mother's affection. But he, as I mentioned, he, feel, he recognizes the father's superior. So he feels what Freud called like a castration anxiety. And in order to resolve this anxiety, this inferiority, the child has to shift his affection from the mother to the father. And as a result of this kind of shifting, he will be able to develop a conscious and a healthy way, and he will also become a heterosexual. Let me remind you, this does not have scientific support. This was Freud's ideas, and for the most part, they're just pop culture nowadays. <clears throat> but if you thought that was bad, you're going to hate the Electra conflict. Because with the Electra conflict, it's basically the same story, but gender swapped with one big difference. You know, So the girl recognizes she's the same gender as the mother, feels conflict and rivalry for the father's affection, needs to shift her affection from the mother to the father, or father to the mother, and it's the same story as last time. But the one big difference here is that she is less able to accomplish this, as Freud says, because she cannot overcome this castration anxiety. In other words, women, according to Freud, don't don't send me angry emails. Women, according to Freud, are less capable of developing a conscience and becoming heterosexual because they do not have a penis. That is literally what Freud was saying. So yeah, this idea is thoroughly rejected by modern experts, myself included. But that's what the electric conflict was. But regardless of Freud's ideas, this period in time is indeed a point where children do start to become more aware of sex issues. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, the, the next stage, according to Freud, and this personality development is called the latency stage. Freud basically said nothing interesting happens here. You know, these are the ages of six to about teenage. And then once they reach the teenage stage, that's what Freud calls the genital stage because that's when full adult like sexuality awakens. You know, this is when they start to become interested in the opposite gender in a sexual way. So here is a table just showing all these different stages when they occur and the basic things that occur during each one. And as I was trying to explain just now, there's important aspects to development, to personality development in particular, that can occur at each stage. So it's important that children don't develop a fixation on any one of these stages, otherwise that will continue on into their adult life indefinitely. Now, I've already kind of thrown Freud under the bus pretty substantially here, but I just want to keep doing that. Because Freud is not a scientist, as I keep saying, and people have heavily criticized him. People even criticized him back then. You know, Freud's own daughter and his, like, apprentices, even they didn't agree with a lot of these ideas. We call those people the Neo-Freudians. You know, they, they took Freud's ideas and they basically made them more realistic, more practical, more applicable. But the whole idea here is... While Freud was a very influential guy, and we still talk about his theories today, a lot of these ideas, they just don't hold up under any kind of scientific uh, investigation. So while they are interesting to talk about, there's really not much else to say. <laughs>